welcome you in now Wednesday night for our midweek service and our Bible study time together. Again, unusual times we're in, streaming services, videos, uh, all of that, even a different location tonight, and uh, just trying to change things up a little bit and want to enjoy uh, this opportunity to come and uh, hopefully be a blessing to many tonight as we're uh, streaming the service. Uh, I want to encourage you to remember one another as we're away right now. Uh, so many of you done well in making contacts and checking in on people, and I've already received updates over the week of, hey, remember to pray for so-and-so, and I uh, remember this family, and let's be sure to contact someone. They're a little lonely. And all of this is helpful, and uh, we certainly appreciate it. Glad to be part of a good church family. Thank you again for this last weekend. Of course, Easter was such a blessing, and um, I'm glad that we can have uh, services and be able to preach God's Word and still have a church family, even in a time of social distancing and all of this uh, epidemic going on. And we'll speak a little bit about that tonight. I do want to remind everybody, uh, this Friday at 6 p.m., if you'd like to join us on a Zoom uh, conference meeting call, you could do that on the video where we could actually see one another and the whole church family, or you could even call in on a phone number. Uh, tomorrow, I'll have that link all available, and we'll be emailing it out uh, to everybody. Whether or not you're able to join, you may get that email. Uh, if Maybe we don't have your email address. You can text this number. Screen. We'll be sure to send you the link as well. And uh, that'll be just a good time tomorrow night just to catch up. Uh, not a formal, excuse me, that'll be Friday night, but not a formal uh, meeting, not a, not a necessary regimen schedule to it, but more of an opportunity just to get folks together, start talking, keep a dialogue, and want to keep connected over these, uh, these weeks here in the month of April. I'm really praying and hoping that we can be back together as a church in the month of May. And it seems like signs are, are positive and optimistic. And I'm not an expert in all of this. And I don't have the answers for what the government may uh, do here in the near future. But I do believe the numbers and the signs uh, are, are favorable uh, as in the last few days. And we're seeing... Um, we're, we're seeing a, a decrease maybe in the number of overall cases of this virus in our local area. Uh, testing's going up. Uh, all of this seems like we, we may be able to uh, get back to normal again. I can't make predictions on it, but uh, you pray with me about that, and we we'll certainly look forward to it. Tonight, I want to introduce a new Bible uh, study theme, and tonight will just be part one of what will be a few to come. And hopefully it'll be more of an engaging time where we can uh, take some, some perspective on the times we're living in and at the same time the mission that God's call us to do. I believe with all my heart that the mission of the church has never been more needed than it is in our day to day. And that mission is to present the gospel of Christ to a lost world. The mission is to disciple believers. The mission is to be united as a church family. And all of this, even though our methods may have changed because of uh, different schedules and now different locations and uh, lack of centralized uh, hub of the church facility, the methods can change, but the mission must not ever change. And I hope we keep that in mind as we navigate the next several weeks and days to come. Uh, chances are, our world as we know it, the lives and the what normal is, may not be the same uh, moving forward. And there may be some new protocols, there may be some new laws, there may be new standards coming around that uh, will start to take effect as a result of what we're experiencing now in our country and world with this virus. And I, I want to approach that a little bit tonight and, and simply say this, um, I'm not a medical expert I'm not a political commentator, I'm not a policymaker, I'm not an executive director of government or anything of that nature. Uh, and I recognize that I don't want to use a platform here for a church or a, a, a stream uh, on the video or as a pastor to try to advance any political or social causes. Again, that's not my field, it's not my expertise. Um, I am a God-called preacher. And as a pastor, I think it's important that... Uh, that we look toward 
helping people understand where we are and what may be coming. And my goal tonight and over the next several weeks in our Bible studies is to take a Bible approach, a biblical premise, and teach through that into what may stem as current events or cultural issues and take God's word and apply it so that we can know how uh, we're to live in these days. And I think it's important as a Christian that we don't ignore what's going on around us. Um, I am concerned. Uh, frankly, it's just one, one, one person in this, this grand scheme of what's going on around us. I'm, I'm concerned for the well-being and the health of people. And I'm concerned for the, the economic climate uh, that we're living in as businesses are shutting down and people are off work and unemployment's going up. And I'm concerned um, about the political powers and, and public um, uh, control that's taking place. Uh, there, there's a lot of things that we could say are concerning and maybe you share them and maybe you have different views. Again, I'm not trying to uh, push one particular view or another, but I do believe that um, times are changing just as the world that uh, my grandparents and, and their parents grew up in changed in the, the 1930s, 1940s, uh, World War II era, when America, of course, went to war and uh, all of these uh, things changed in our country with business and manufacturing and the labor force, let alone the military um, experience and then people coming back and integrating back into society. We call it the greatest generation. And yet undoubtedly things changed that will never go back to certain what was normal prior to the war. Uh, some things changed for the good, some things maybe not so good. Uh, we've seen changes even in our own lifetime. Uh, Pre-9-11, now post-9-11. My children will grow up in a world having never known what it was like before uh, the World Trade Center attacks there in September the 11th of 2001, and uh, where terrorism now is a, a threat. And our nation, our world changed after that event. Securities and different measures and protocols and policies and politics and all of that changed because of one event. And I'm looking at where we're at today in our world and, and believe a little bit that this uh, virus pandemic will change uh, our new future and the what we perceive as normal. So with that, as we embrace changing times and uncertain uh, climate, by the way, that's always been part of the world. It's always changing and always unpredictable. Uh, we need to learn to find something that's stable and grasp onto it and take something that uh, will never change and shape and pattern our lives by it. If we as Christians or, or really any people try to live according to what's always changing, if we grab onto the economy, well, that's always changing. Uh, don't run your life according to uh, job and economics and, and, and uh, financial status. It, it's changing. We, we shouldn't run our life according to uh, the political climate. It's always changing not run our life according to uh, social status. Why? It's always changing. Yet there are some things that never change. Of course, God's word never changes. God's commandments never change. God's promises never change. God's principles, they never change. And these are things I believe firmly that we need to learn to grab onto and to, to shape our lives after and to live for. With that in mind, I invite you to take your Bible to Daniel chapter number one. Daniel chapter one, tonight just part one of what will be a few weeks here in a series uh, that I'm going to entitle this, Righteousness in Babylon. Righteousness in Babylon. Now Babylon uh, in the Bible times, in the book of Daniel, was a world empire. Uh, it was cresting toward its peak of uh, greatness and prosperity and uh, world-renowned acclamation, Babylon was now under control of Nebuchadnezzar. He was the king. History tells us that Nebuchadnezzar was the most powerful and most dominant king of the Babylonian Empire. 
uh, one of the world's greatest civilizations. This is where great prosperity, great wealth, great um, global uh, conquering took place in this Babylonian empire. This is where scholastic achievements and arts and sciences and all of the world's knowledge started taking place in Babylon. Uh, of course, uh, a, a religious climate started to grow and rise in Babylon. It was a, it was a very multi-religious um, uh, experience with all kinds of polytheism and uh, multiple gods and idolatry and uh, people with, with false temples and uh, worship practices and pagan experiences. This was the Babylonian Empire, and frankly, it was a godless, wicked society, but in the world's eye, it was a very prosperous and very um, great people. Again, great to, in their, their uh, political experience, and great in their financial gain, and great in their conquest, and, and uh, military might, and great in their education and social um, practices, great in the, the arts and the culture, all of that, yet in God's eyes, we would maybe look at that and say that was a very wicked people as well. And in this, this nation of Babylon, we're going to read here in just a moment, in come now a group of people from the nation of Israel, particularly the land of Judah. These were people who had traditionally been God's people. They were those who feared the Lord. They were those who uh, obeyed the Mosaic law. They were those who um, were the descendants from uh, all the way back to Abraham, coming out of the, the wilderness and the, through the, the promised land, and now uh, through a series of kings from David and his line all the way down, even after the nation split. The people of Judah traditionally were those who feared God and kept his commandments. However, through a series of time, these uh, Israelites, these Hebrews, became hard in their heart and idolatrous in their practices and began following after strange gods. And of course, the Lord God Jehovah judged his people and sent Babylon in to take them captive. That's where we pick up the story here in Daniel chapter 1. And I'd like you to uh, maybe read along. I'm going to put the words up on the screen. You could follow. But Daniel chapter 1, the Bible says, In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, unto Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with, with part of the vessels of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar, to the house of his God. And he brought the vessels into the treasure house of his God. So pause for just a moment. This king, Nebuchadnezzar, came into Ju uh, Judah, the, the land here where God's people were, and raided the temple, took out the uh, vessels of gold, took out the holy things, took out the expensive things, and brought them back to Babylon to put in the house of his God. Very pagan. And of course, this is something that God's people should not have been pleased with and something that the Lord himself would not accept. But let's keep reading in verse number three. And the king spake unto uh, Ashpenaz, the master of the eunuchs, that he should bring certain of the children of Israel and of the king's seed and of the princes, children in whom was no blemish, but well favored and skillful in all wisdom and cunning and knowledge and understanding science and such as had ability in them to stand in the king's palace and whom they might teach the learning of the tongue of the Chaldeans. And the king appointed them a daily provision of the king's meat and of the wine which he drank, so nourishing them three years, and at the end thereof they might stand before the king. Now again, we'll pause for a moment. Not only did King Nebuchadnezzar bring the vessels of gold out of the temple uh, and, and bring them into a, his, his false god and false temple and use for idolatrous purposes, but he also brought certain of the people from Judah. And the Bible tells us these were, these were educated people. These were royal people. These were noble people. Uh, they were the king's lines. They were uh, those who were cunning in sciences and knowledge and wisdom and skill and craftiness. Uh, these weren't commoners. These weren't just the, the labor force, the, the blue collar group. These were the upper echelon, the, the well favored, those who could serve the king of Babylon, stand in his court and uh, pick up the culture and the customs of Babylon and make it a prosperous nation. Now, verse number six tells us specifically who some of these people were. Look at that with me. 
Uh, now among these were the children of Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, unto whom the king of the uh, excuse me, unto whom the prince of the eunuchs gave names, for he gave unto Daniel the name of Belteshazzar, and to Hananiah of Shadrach, and to Mishael of Meshach, and to Azariah of Abednego. Verse number eight, but Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Now, why does it seem as Christians that sometimes we are always fighting an uphill battle? Have you ever felt that way? As long as, as, long as history records, God's people have always been trying to uh, press on and fulfill his will and do right and live according to God's commandments, but the road has never been easy. Some may think, well, because we're Christians, God should just make everything that much easier for us. Uh, if God wants, if we're saved and we're living after the Lord, shouldn't he just make our way easy and give us a, a, a good life and give us peace and prosperity in everything that we do? But that's not the case that we find both historically nor biblically and it's not in the nature of God. We recognize this, that our people, Christians, God's people, have always been mocked. They've always been um, uh, disbelieved. Uh, this is why you can take uh, God's word and, and try to share it with somebody and sometimes get scoffed at or uh, told that, that you're uh, believing a lie. Uh, God's people have always been ridiculed or persecuted and martyred and chased away. Uh, marginalized and mischaracterized and wrongfully labeled. Uh, it's amazing what people really think, the, what the world's perception of what Christians are. Some think we're a cult. Some think that we're uh, a fairy tale group. Some think that we're uh, using church or God as a crutch just to get through the ills of life. And all of this is natural in the world's view of Christians. But I want to encourage us tonight that we as Christians have the right view of the world and also the right view of God. So in these lessons, Righteousness in Babylon, I want us to take a biblical worldview of the times that we live in, the circumstances that we're involved with, and our response to it. We recognize this, the world will never treat Christians, God's people, the way that uh, we're to treat them. In other words, Christians should always influence and treat the world better than we would ever expect to be treated. After all, look at what they did to Jesus himself. If the world did not receive Christ when he came as a man and they ultimately killed him, the religious crowd and the political crowd uh, nailed Jesus to a cross, what more do you think they would do to us as believers? Why would we expect to be treated any differently than Christ? Why would we expect our lives to be any easier? So tonight, I'm going to just give a brief introduction to this idea of righteousness in Babylon. Then over the next few weeks, maybe unfold some practical ways that you and I can live in a, in a wicked land and still make a difference. That's what the book of Daniel really is about at, its, at its, its core level. The whole, the whole book teaches about a group of people who were brought into a wicked land where they still decided to serve the Lord and God blessed them. And not just them, but God blessed the land itself. God blessed this wicked nation of Babylon because his people decided to do right. Now think for just a moment. The land that we live in, and I love our country, and I love our state, and I love the communities that we live in, but from coast to coast and border to border, I believe you could say with me that America is not the uh, sanction of a Christian nation that you and I would want it to be. Or maybe that we would show historically we have been. Uh, America has a lot of faults. There is plenty of pagan practices even in our own country. 
Sadly, there's a lot of wickedness. There's a lot of anti-God uh, activity. There is uh, what seems to be more and more of a suppression of God's people and more and more uplifting of humanism and secularism. And ultimately, it comes down to anything that's anti-God and anti-Bible has been elevated to a, a place of, uh, of almost distraction, just trying to get anything away from a semblance of righteousness. So I want to use these lessons to kind of correlate the idea, how did Daniel and what we know as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, how did they live and not just live and survive, but they actually thrived and prospered? How did they do it in a wicked land of Babylon? How did righteousness prevail despite the surroundings of such uh, political and social and religious downfall in the land of Babylon? How did God's word prevail even when it was against the law? Now, I'm not trying to make direct comparisons to say that America is the next Babylon. I'm not saying that our president is King Nebuchadnezzar. I'm not saying that uh, you and I will be faced with the same uh, decisions that Daniel was as far as... Uh, laws saying you can't pray and a den of lions is the consequence, that may or may not happen in our lifetime. But I do believe, I do believe that righteousness still must learn to prevail, whether in Babylon, in America, thousands of years ago, or today in 2020. Righteousness has to move on and God's word has to be true. If everything else around us is changing, may we as believers learn to, again, hold on to what doesn't change. I want to give three simple statements tonight by way of introduction to these series of lessons. Number one, we're going to look at God's sovereignty. God's sovereignty. The sovereignty of God means that God is in control. I heard somebody once give a definition to say, God does what God does because God is who God is. And that kind of sums up his sovereignty. Uh, he is in control, and he's the ultimate authority. I like this statement. It's helped me a lot over the years. Anything that's outside of our control is in his control. Right now, this virus, this pandemic going around, uh, it's certainly outside of my control. And it's really outside of any human's control. Uh, there are political powers looking for control. There are medical powers looking for control. There are state and local and national powers looking for control, but nobody has that. What I would say then is if it's not in our control, well, it's in God's control. And if it's in God's control, then it's in a good place. God is sovereign. God is still in control when it seems like we've lost everything we've worked for or that we've once had. Remember this, God is still on the throne. When it seems like the world is quickly changing and we have no uh, security, God is still in control. Think about Daniel for a moment. He was living in the land of Judah. He was living in, in God's land. And now taken over by Nebuchadnezzar, he was carried away to Babylon. Strange land different language, different culture, um, anti-God society. How, how did Daniel navigate his way through this? How did he rise to the level of God's blessing that he found? How did Daniel uh, make a difference in such a wicked place? By the way, Daniel never turned the nation of Babylon to righteousness. They never saw a national revival. They didn't see um, the God of heaven elevated and exalted in the wicked land. And Daniel served there for his entire life, for decades. But Daniel still did right. You and I may never see America turn as a whole back to God. We may never see national revival that we once read about. All the bars closing, uh, you know, 
outlawing certain sins. We may, may never see Planned Parenthood close the doors. We may never see some of these things that we would consider benchmarks of revival. But it doesn't mean that God's not in control. And it doesn't mean that God's not using us to make a difference where we're at. Much like Daniel, he was brought into a wicked environment. I wonder if God is, in his sovereignty, put us where we are in the middle of America, in the year of 2020, in the midst of uncertain times. Why would God let us live here? I wonder if it's because he's got a purpose. Truth is, I know he does. We find God's sovereignty. He is control. But secondly, we do find God's purpose. God's purpose. We know that God's purpose is this. In all things, he gets the glory. That's his purpose. Not to elevate man, but to elevate himself. Uh, this is why we must learn to lift up Christ put down ourselves. There's no human reasoning, no elevation of, of man's status that is going to prosper this land. It must be God being lifted up. And God's purpose is that he gets the glory. Please remember this, regardless of how economic times turn for us, regardless of how the health crisis turns for us, regardless of what political powers may rise and fall, if God doesn't get the glory, then we as Christians have failed. It does not matter who sits in the White House. It does not matter who sits in the, uh, the, the job market. It does not matter what uh, accounts are in the bank. It does not matter uh, how many hospital beds are full or empty. If God's not getting the glory, we have failed. Please never think that uh, God is... God's purpose is just to give prosperity to the land. God's purpose is that he gets the glory. And if it takes a virus and if it takes a political or economic downfall uh, for him to get the glory, he will get the glory. Please remember his purpose. We know his purpose is that his light would spread. Uh, God calls himself the light of the world. And he wants his light to spread. He also calls you and I the light. And that's why in Matthew chapter 5, he calls us, let your light so shine before men. That's his purpose. He wants us to shine. He wants his light to shine and he wants his gospel preached. God's commanded for us as Christians to preach his gospel everywhere. Uh, whether it's uh, by way of video closed uh, to the, the public, whether it's in churches and, and uh, buildings all around our country, whether it's door to door, down the street, whether it's uh, at a local restaurant or a gas station or a place of business, God wants his word preached and that is his purpose. Then we find thirdly, God's plan. What is his plan to fulfill his purpose so that he gets the glory because he's sovereign? His plan is this. He uses his children to influence the darkness that's God's plan. Um, we can go all the way back to the book of Genesis. Every uh, time that God did something uh, world-changing, he used somebody to go into the darkness and make a difference. Remember Joseph, who was the son of Jacob, the son of Isaac, the son of Abraham. Joseph was sold into slavery, and he, where did he end up? He ended up in the land of Egypt. Egypt was a wicked land. Egypt was soon facing a famine that would have destroyed civilization. But God used Joseph in a miraculous way to influence that society and to save them from destruction. God didn't make Egypt come to Joseph, rather he made Joseph go to Egypt. God wants us, he wants to put us in a place where we get to influence, where we as light get to make a difference. Uh, 
all through the New Testament. That's where the gospel spread. Everywhere Paul went and Peter went and the, the early church uh, disciples and the apostles as they took God's light into the darkness. It wasn't always comfortable. It wasn't always convenient, but it made a difference. And I believe with all my heart that God's plan for you and I is to take our light and shine it into the darkness. Um, just as much as it pleased God the Father to bruise his own son, Jesus. Why? So that he could save the world. Don't you think it also pleases God to put us in maybe unfavorable conditions so that we can send out his light, so that we can fulfill his purpose? I'll be honest with you. I wish that uh, we didn't have to go through this virus thing. I wish we didn't have a, uh, a shutdown of, of businesses. I wish we didn't have um, hardship of, of staying away from each other. But I believe that God has a purpose and his plan is he's going to make it a little bit dark, a little uncomfortable so that his light can shine brighter. And that's why we must be sensitive to his leading. We'll find next week how Daniel allowed this dark influence of the nation of Babylon to allow his light to shine and make a difference. And these are the things I want us to be mindful of. I'm going to pause here tonight and then ask you to join in by next week as we come back and kind of start taking shape. But tonight, a little bit of introduction, a little bit of maybe just kind of setting the scene of, of where we're going. If you would understand the idea that Daniel made a difference in Babylon, okay, righteousness always makes a difference. And whether we live in the United States of America, whether we live in the state of Indiana, whether we lived in uh, communist China, or we lived in a third world country, there is always darkness because sin abounds. But as long as God's people have the light of the gospel, we can make a difference. And it does not matter uh, what the government does, does not matter what the health community does, does not matter what the economic structure does. We have God's light and we can make a difference. As long as our righteousness prevails, the darkness will dissipate. Please, let's not give up. Let's not... Uh, let ourselves become complacent or defeated or discouraged in these days. This is part of God's plan. And I want us to be mindful that God can use us. I'm going to pray tonight and I'll ask you to even consider what is it that God wants to see in your life? What does God want to do for our and through our church in these dark times? How do we allow God's light to penetrate further into the darkness? How do we make a difference? Is it a difference politically? Is it a difference uh, socially? Is it a difference economically? Is it a difference uh, religiously? I know this, God's word always makes a difference. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, tonight we do pray that you would help us to make a difference in the world that we live in. Lord, we see the days of Daniel where Babylon was such a wicked place, and yet you used him and you prospered him. Lord, I pray that you would use us now. Help us to make a difference in the land we live in. And God, I pray for a healing of America. Pray for a healing of our world. God, that you would get the glory through all of this and that you would use we as your people to certainly influence those around us and as light to overpower the darkness. We ask for your power to do so. We love you tonight. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to say thank you for watching the service tonight. Let's have a great week ahead. If you need anything, please let me know. God bless. Good night.